Good morning, and welcome to the Mini Storage Messenger webinar series. I'm Poppy Behrens, publisher of MiniCo Incorporated, and we're delighted to have you in the audience today. This is one of several informative webinars planned for self-storage and mobile storage owners, operators, managers, investors, developers, and other industry professionals. In addition, this is the first of several webinars planned for the Mobile Self-Storage Association. This webinar is sponsored by the 2008 Mobile Self-Storage Association Annual Conference Exhibitors and Sponsors. They are Carolina Covertech, Chateau Products, College Boxes, DHS Worldwide Software Solutions, Gotainer, Jones Body Company, Contain Incorporated, MyBox Moving and Mobile Storage, Minico Incorporated, Moffitt, Seattle Tacoma Box Company, SMD Software, Storage Insurance LLC, Stortador, Supreme Corporation, The Hardtop, TrackD Building Systems. Today we have the distinct pleasure of hearing from three speakers that are affiliated with the Mobile Self Storage Association. First is Buck Ramsey, the Director of Mobile Storage and Moving Services for Sarasota, Florida-based Hideaway Storage, a leader in the self-storage industry for more than 30 years. With over 13 years of management experience in self-storage and other industries, Buck provides oversight for two divisions of Hideaway. Derek Naylor is the President of Storage Marketing Solutions, and over the past seven years, Derek has incrementally increased sales revenue for his clients for more than, by more than $250 million through innovation and advanced marketing strategies. He is a regular contributor to industry magazines and a dynamic speaker at trade show events. Derek lives in Pleasant Valley, Utah with his wife and two daughters. And our third speaker is James Dusty Rhodes, Vice President of Franchise Operations and past Vice President of Business Development for Richmond, Virginia-based Smartbox, a leading provider of portable moving and storage services to residential and commercial customers. This year marks the 30th anniversary of Mini Storage Messenger, the original voice of the self-storage industry. Mini Co. Publishing also produces Mobile Self Storage Magazine, which is the official publication of the Mobile Self Storage Association. Each messenger of Mini Storage Messenger provides readers with in-depth news and information. Its cover stories and feature articles explore the most timely industry topics and trends. In addition, monthly columns contributed by industry experts and accomplished business professionals address a wide range of topics, including security, including security, facility operations, technology, legal issues, legislative updates, construction, and development. For more information about these publications or those that you see listed on your screen, please visit our website at ministoragemessenger.com. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing on demand from our archives. The, those are located at ministoragemessenger.com. We invite you to submit questions throughout today's webinar. To do so, simply type your question into the question area and click send. While we will try to answer as many questions as we can during the Q&A period at the end of the webinar, those questions that cannot be answered due to time constraints will be answered by way of email after the webinar. Today's presentation should run approximately 45 minutes with the remainder of the hour open to questions and answers. Before we start the webinar, I would also like to mention that the Mobile Self Storage Association will be holding its 2009 conference in conjunction with the National Portable Storage Association. More details will be provided about this event at the end of today's presentation. And now, without any further ado, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Buck. Good morning, Buck. Good morning, Bobby. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about working with disaster relief organizations. First of all, I'd like to start with and give you some background history on how we have partnership with the American Red Cross. We have been partners with Red Cross for about three years. Uh, through this, we have provided them with delivery service of our mobile containers. We have divided, provided to, to them uh, warehouse space, our labor. And this is, has been a very good um, partnership with them. We have um, created some good uh, leads from them. We have gotten some good feedback from uh, the media. Uh, we had. About, three, about a year and a half ago, we were activated for a, a fire in Lehigh Acres. And we were there 
When we got the response, we were there within two hours of the response time, delivering the supplies of water, food, and bedding for the burned out uh, victims. And while we were there, there was um, media there, the TVs, uh, newspapers, and we got great uh, remarks from them, and it's a great lead for our organization. Next, I'd like to talk about establishing credibility. This is one of the most key important things you can do when you're working with disaster relief uh, organizations, because they need to know that you, they can count on you, they need to know that you'll be there when they call upon you, and that it can be uh, good and bad uh, if you're not able to show up and, and people are in, in need of things. It's very, very, um, can cause some problems with uh, servicing the disaster relief organizations. The people that are calling you, they want your response. Um, the men and women, they just need to know that you can, they can count on you for any type of needs that they have because we are a drug-free workplace. They need to know that you have personnel that are drug-free. Uh, they don't need someone showing up there that's hung over from the night before. They just need to have people that can count on and be there for you, for them, and also they can be there for you. Our next slide will be providing service. We provide numerous types of service for the Red Cross. We offer our mobile storage containers. We offer transporting supplies. We also uh, offer warehouse space. We also offer our labor service and temporary on-site storage for shelters. And this is something that it, it's ongoing. It will um, create more opportunities for, the, uh, for us Far as far as Red Cross, but whoever gets into disaster relief organizations, it just gives you so much opportunity to work within the community. There's two levels of service. There's the standby um, activation status. This is a ongoing non-emergency condition, and we'll go over this in our next slide. And then there's alert status. Um, as a Another one we'll go over and, and um, through our next slide. So we'll go to the standby status. This is something we offer. It's an ongoing monthly fee that we have set up, set down with Red Cross. We sit down and they figure out how much um, supplies they need to store. We have 10, 10 mobile containers with them year-round. This is a monthly fee that uh, we build the Red Cross for. And there's always a place to stage and unload trucks. This is the warehouse space. We offer them a place to store their um, trailers when they come in with supplies. We offer them insurance. And we deliver the containers up, you know, up to 10, 10 containers. Um, and we also go out of the area, too, for an extra additional charge. And we do that sometimes. We go to the airports, uh, the ports to pick up supplies for them. We also offer the um, labor. Then we go to the alert status. This is when we are in call. This is when they activate us. They call us. They give us a situation where to, to go. They tell us the, what the disaster is. They give us a time frame to be there. We offer them, we bring the containers to them that they have stored in our warehouse. And then we offer, also offer a larger container to stay on site. This is an on, on, uh, ongoing monthly service charge. This is another way that we create the revenue with the disaster relief organizations. It's, like I said, it's an ongoing thing as far as the one status. Um, then this is the alert status. This is something that we um, constantly are on call for them. So after that, special conditions. This is something that we um, have set up with them. Let me just go through a couple of these. When you set up a uh, program with a disaster relief program, you have to have some certain contact people. They need to be able to be reachable at all times. 
day or night. This is someone that they know they can get a hold to 24 hours a day. Usually we set up two people in case one's not available. They can always call the second person. And this, through this, this occurs over time. This occurs a stress on your regular uh, service to your regular customers. And this is something that you really have to know about because when you, if you're like us through tough times, you're lean staff, and this is something that could put some bind on your staff that you have. But to set up this is um, it's where you've got to be committed to them. After our drivers, this is one of the most important things. They need to be able to be contacted and be at the location within two hours of the contacting you for the disaster relief because they're waiting on their supplies to get there. So this is a key thing that we have set up with them that we would have people that they can contact and they know that we will have the personnel to fulfill our obligations with them. And so when you're looking at this, just remember that you will recur some overtime and it will put strain on your normal operations, but this is where you've got to be committed to the people that you sign up with. The next slide. During the last three years uh, with Red Cross, we've only been um, alert, on the alert status for uh, two or three times, and one for hurricane preparation, one for wildfires. But through the course of the three years, or a little over three years now, it's been a great um, partnership with Red Cross. We have provided them good service. They have provided us some good leads with people that have, they have been involved with. And this has given us additional um, revenue and this is something that has really benefited us as an organization here at Hanaway to hook up with someone like the Red Cross because they have serviced us and we have serviced them too. So it's been a great uh, partnership with them. I know there's probably going to be a lot of quest questions at the end because there, there are things that you have to be aware of when you go into something like this. And like I said, one of the key things is the being there for them because they're counting on you. And if you, they can't count on you, they don't need you. Summary of this. If you have the warehouse and labor to handle such requirements, it's a great way to get hooked up with providing a steady income, a monthly income, from someone that you know that you can get paid for from and to work with them. Like I said, the media is one of the key things that has really come out of it. You see um, your storage containers on TV sitting at a disaster place. It, it gives you a good feeling to know that you're there to help people, but people see that you are uh, there helping them and it brings in great um, satisfaction to your company to do this. So I know there will be a lot of questions and we'll answer the questions at the end. Um, now I'd like to introduce uh, Derek, President of Storage and Marketing Solutions. All righty. Thanks for that, Buck. And it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, let me try and advance this slide here. Um, today I'm going to be talking about something that is certainly on everybody's mind. Um, at least uh, everywhere I am, and it's on the news. New, in fact, news stations are using it. Um, I'm sure you've heard about it from your your friends and family, and I'm sure that most of you on this call participate in some way with social media, um, otherwise knowing as social networking. So the title of the presentation today is Social Media Mastery for Mobile Storage Operators. One of the challenges is that there's a lot of noise about this. Everyone's talking about it. And nobody is really quite sure, partially due to the, um, the infancy of the media, um, but nobody's really quite sure how to capitalize on this and if it's something they should be doing as part of their business. 
Um, certainly there's a lot of noise, again, about it, but nobody's really quite sure how to make money at it. And there's a lot of different ways that these social media and social networking sites are trying to capitalize on all the traffic they receive by offering advertising programs, and um, it's still so new. But we have, uh, at Storage Marketing Solutions, have figured out a couple of ways that have been proven to be profitable to the self-storage and mobile storage industry, and today I'm going to give you a quick overview of that. So first off, the a lot of people ask, what exactly is social media? Social media is a shift in how people discover, read, and share news, information, and content. Again, a lot of these news stations are actually using websites like Facebook and Twitter to launch headline stories. It supports the human need for social interaction with technology transforming broadcast media monologues, which is one to many, like Walter Cronkite, uh, Tom Brokaw, and so forth, and the nightly news that we're all used to, into social media dialogues. The keyword, I think, there is dialogue versus monologue, which is many to many. Um, when I give people that definition, a lot of them say, okay, um, that's fine, but what about the non-technical definition? And so here's the definition that I came up with from a marketing perspective. Social media is social networking, which is equivalent to an online bar or coffee shop where people feel safe to discuss inner feelings and thoughts and make statements about who they like and who they are. Due to the popularity of this, an audience is created and capitalized on by the website owners. So the main, the main thing I want to point out here is it's like an online bar or coffee shop where people feel safe. There's been an analogy drawn out there that I really like, which is these, Facebook protects people from the big bad Internet where it's dangerous and there's, there's things that they don't want to see, there's things they don't want to be aware of. With websites like Facebook and Twitter, if you're not friends with somebody or you're not following somebody who you don't trust or like, and you don't have to hear about the things you don't want to hear about. Okay? Um, so, it's, and, and I'll tell you in a little while why this is important, but people feel safe and comfortable to discuss their inner feelings and thoughts and make statements about who they are. By following somebody on Twitter or by being a friend or fan of somebody on Facebook, you are making, you're not only letting them know that you like them, letting other people know that you like them, you're also making a statement about who you are and what it is that you like. Okay? Um, social media sites that are most popular now are Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and MySpace. Most popular right now uh, are Facebook and Twitter. Facebook has now officially passed, surpassed MySpace. And there's a lot of people talking about that MySpace is, is going to be a thing of the past here shortly, and Facebook is going to take it over. But those are the most popular sites right now. Facebook and Twitter are probably the most commonly talked about from a marketing perspective because they um, – have real proven marketing applications to them. Um, these websites present opportunities to um, to not just storage operators, but also to you know any business. And those opportunities are pay-per-click advertising, which is the same as Google's platform. If you're familiar with that, where you can you can select an audience, you can create an ad, and it'll show up on the right-hand side of the page. So if you do a Google search and you see the ads on the right-hand side, those are paper click ads. And the advertiser, or you in this case, pays every time pays a certain amount that's uh, formulated based on, a, on an algorithm and on your, your bid prices every time somebody clicks on that. Facebook has a pay per click platform um, that, that is pretty relevant for the mobile storage industry. Banner advertising is available, although not recommended for the mobile storage or storage industry. Fan pages are specifically um, a, a, a uh, Facebook thing, and that's where you have a Facebook profile. Um, you can set up a fan page, and people on Facebook can say, hey, I'm a fan of XYZ mobile storage, and their friends and, and followers can see that. Um, the other opportunity is entering the conversation, and this is the most important thing um, that I want you to get to, to glean from this is trying to enter the conversation. Remember, this is, these are like online bars or coffee shops. The conversations being had uh, on Twitter and on Facebook are not at all unlike conversations going on at a coffee shop. They're talking about clothing and movies and, and pop culture and things that are affecting them with somebody who they know and trust. And then the last opportunity with these is easy message publishing. These websites all give uh, business as an opportunity to publish to me publish a message, whether it be in text or a video or an audio file, and share it with the world. The pros of social media marketing are that it's cheap, 
It can be effective if it's done right, it's easy, and it's part of a changing world. Um, as everybody knows, the Internet is, is not going anywhere. It's not one of those fads that's going to die off. In fact, it's changing the way that our entire world functions. And our current president, Obama, generated a, he shocked the entire world with his use of social media and the Internet to, to generate amazing amounts of, of money for his campaign. So it's a part of a changing world, and getting on board with it and learning how to participate and use it to your advantage um, is really important and highly recommend it. It's not something that's just going to go away. Um, the cons are that social media can be a time vampire. What I mean by that is there are a lot of operators out there who say, yeah, this is all great and everything, but I don't want my staff updating their Facebook profile and chit-chatting with their friends while they're supposed to be getting work done. So if it's not managed properly, it can be a time vampire, and, and you, know, you can really lose control of, of your day and your staff's time if you're not careful. The second thing um, that's a negative with social media is that inaccurate or negative brand representation can occur. If you have somebody, if you have an employee who you've given access to your Facebook or Twitter account, and they have basically free reign to say what it is they want without approval from you, um, they can give you negative brand representation if they get caught up in a political argument or some local debate and they're representing your brand. Uh, the world can see that and it can hurt your business. So that's something to be careful of. Uh, on the previous slide, I said it can be it can be cheap or inexpensive. It can also be costly if it's done wrong. If you don't know how to manage a pay-per-click budget or a pay-per-click campaign, you can spend an absolute fortune on it without getting a whole lot of results. Um, and again, it can also be very costly from a time perspective, which of course has real monetary value. And the last con that's most common is that everybody now has a voice and can say what they want, which is also a pro, which we'll get into later. But there's been many instances in the storage industry where um, a, a self-storage facility has done somebody wrong, or at least they perceived they were done wrong to, and they get onto their Facebook account or they get onto their Twitter account, and they tell all of their friends and family how bad that XYZ storage stinks and they rip them off and nobody should ever use them. Now, whether or not that actually happened or it's right or it's wrong, it doesn't matter. What matters is they have a voice, they have a stage, and they can get up and say pretty much whatever they want, and there's not a whole lot you can do about it. And a lot of times before you can do something about it, it's too late, and all their friends and family already have a negative perception of you. Okay? Um, so there's pros and cons. It's important to be aware of, of both of those. So there's basically three areas that um, I put under the do-it-right category for the mobile storage industry. The first is, to, and we're going to go into each one of these after this slide, the first is to enter the conversation that people are having with their friends and followers. The second is to test the pay-per-click platform on Facebook. Um, due to the reason I have mobile in parentheses there is for traditional self-storage facilities, it's not nearly as lucrative. But for mobile self-storage or mo mobile storage facilities and operators, due to the large geographic territory you can cover, you can you can advertise to a lot more people, and it makes a lot more sense because you can scale it out geographically. And then the third thing that I recommend all mobile storage operators do is publish differentiators, um, which are things that make you different from your competitors and um, traditional self-storage. So entering the conversation, which, again, I think is the most powerful way to utilize social media right now, and that's to, you know, if you can imagine a group of friends sitting around talking at a coffee shop or a bar, that would be equivalent to walking up to that circle of friends and having one of the friends say, oh, hey, this is... This is Bob Johnson. He uh, owns XYZ Mobile Storage, and they are awesome. They deliver a container to your house, and they, you take your time loading it up. They pick it back up and store it at their facility. They're really great, and they're affordable. You guys should use them. You've just gotten an endorsement from a current customer, which is very powerful, and you've entered a conversation where people are actually paying attention, which is different than traditional advertising where you have to try and interrupt and get them to pay attention. The best way to do that is to use email marketing systems and strategically designed collateral for your customers and give them an ethical bribe to talk about you and become a fan of you if you have a fan page on Facebook. So um, essentially what you do is when you get a new customer, put them into an email marketing system, send them an email, and, and give them a bribe or an ethical bribe, if you will, to tell all their friends and followers on Facebook or Twitter or MySpace, whatever they're using, 
to that that you're a great that they just moved in with you that you're a great company you treated them honestly and so forth and that because they're a friend of theirs you will give them a discount if they mention a code and just put that code in the email and then offer them to give them a $25 credit on their account if they do that and send you the link now again is it worth $25 absolutely you're getting in front of you're getting in front of a, a, a good size audience but more importantly it's the tone of the conversation and the trust that you're entering that makes it all worthwhile and um, the rentals can come pretty drastically and pretty fast if you do it with the right people so again when you get a new customer get their email information put them into an email marketing autoresponder sequence which I'll um, talk more about or give you the opportunity to learn more about and um, give them the opportunity to introduce you to their circles so you can enter the conversation the second thing I recommend that all mobile operators do is test pay-per-click Create an account within Facebook. It's really easy to do. Just click on the, the Advertising Opportunities button. Create an account. Select your target demographics and geographic areas, which is pretty easy to do. You can select by zip code or, or county. You can select by state if you service the whole state. You can pretty much select any way you want. Create an ad um, and publish your ad. It, and it, set up your account. They'll charge you on a pay-per-click basis. So the only time you're going to pay is if someone actually clicks on the ad and it's taken to your website or your landing page. I recommend you, ta you test this and test it on a, on a CPA basis, which if, if you're not sure what that means, it stands for cost per acquisition, which means how much does it cost you to acquire a new customer. So if you spend $100 on clicks using this platform and you get one customer from it, your cost per acquisition is $100, which is a great deal for most mobile operators. Um, and it, again, it's very easy to do. Create a, just log into your Facebook profile if you have one. If you don't, set one up. It's quick and easy. Um, go to the advertising section, set up your account. You can create an ad. Um, you are given the option to use a picture in Facebook ads, which I highly, highly recommend you do. They, they're visual. They capture attention and pay a lot of attention. In fact, you can increase response on your pay-per-click ads by using different pictures. Um, so split test different pictures and test that on a cost per acquisition basis. If it works for you and you're able to acquire new customers at a reasonable cost per acquisition, um, which in, in my definition is as long as you're paying less for a customer than they're worth to you, then you're doing good. Um, obviously, you want to pay at least uh, the least amount possible, but um, that's the way to test it. And then the, the last thing that I recommend all mobile operators do is publish uh, information. And this, is, this can mainly be done through YouTube. But you can link your YouTube videos uh, through Twitter and Facebook so that all your followers and friends can see that and share it with their networks as well. Um, create videos that show your services in action. A lot of people still don't know what mobile storage is and how it works. Uh, a lot of savvy mobile operators have created videos and put them on their website that show how mobile storage works. They don't have to be really complicated. Get customer testimonials. You can uh, you can get a, a flip a flip camera, which are about the size of a cell phone, have your driver take them with you or, or ride along with your driver for a day and get testimonials from your customers saying that you showed up on time and what a great service it is. Publish those on YouTube and share them with your networks. Um, publish key differentiators. If you have anything that makes you different or better than your competitors, you need to publish that um, on Facebook and Twitter and, so, and YouTube and so forth so that um, not only your networks and followers see that, but also it's a great tool to email a customer. If somebody calls and and isn't quite sure if they're going to use you and you get their email address, you can send them links to all these videos, and it helps do a good job uh, um, selling for you. And publish them with strategic keywords to help with your search engine optimization. Um, uh, this is a pretty new and advanced topic, so I've, I've put together a, um, a couple of free gifts for you if you're interested. Um, the first is a social media map for mobile, mobile operators. We've created a special... Uh, flowchart map for you that outlines all of this and gives you resources on how to do it. Um, we'll send that to you for free. It just goes through the process and, and gives you a visual to follow um, since we've only had about 15 minutes today. And the second gift that we'd, I'd like to give you to help you through this is a 30-minute marketing tune-up, which is uh, we review not just your social media marketing strategy, but your entire marketing strategy and give you pointers on what you might be missing. If you're interested in this, uh, please send an email to info info like information shortened at storage marketing solutions.com and just put free gifts in the subject line and uh, we'll send that right out to you and now I introduce you to Dusty Rhodes who is the vice president of franchise operations for Smartbox 
Thanks a lot, Derek. Uh, first, I just want to thank the uh, Mini Storage Messenger and uh, the MSSA for, for putting on this great webinar. The you know, topic of my discussion today revolves around long distance moving and the long distance moving opportunity that mobile storage operators have and have the potential to, uh, to take part in. You know, one of the great benefits that mobile storage uh, has been able to really unlock over the last you know, 10 or so years has really been that ability to be not only a storage player or you know, not strictly a, uh, a moving player, but to be able to do a combination. And you know, traditionally uh, with you know, local uh, mobile storage operators, they've really been able to handle that storage need exceptionally well. Uh, and been able to handle that local moving uh, business uh, very well in a way that you know traditional self storage really has a hard time with, um, and certainly is you know much more cost effective than uh, than the van line and the uh, the traditional full service moving industry. So it really plays a big role in being able to to satisfy a niche that's out there in the marketplace. Uh, one of the things that uh, we realized at, at Smartbox, and I think people uh, throughout the industry have started to realize, is that you know customers have come to us and have said, you know, we're not moving cross town, but we're moving cross country. How do we, you know, how can you help us do that? And so, really, the the topic of this conversation today is is, is simply that: what are the ways that you can take advantage of uh, long distance moving, and uh, so what I thought I would do to begin is really just touch on what does the opportunity look like at a global level, at a macro level, and then uh, share a couple of ideas and strategies on how to take advantage of uh, this opportunity. Looks like I'm moving uh, a couple of slides ahead. There we go. <coughs> really interesting. What I put up here uh, comes directly from the U.S. Census, uh, but relates specifically to the number of moves that go on uh, throughout the United States every single year. And uh, you know, as you can tell, we've seen a, uh, a uh, decrease in the uh, number of uh, moves that have taken place uh, between 2007 and 2008 uh, of roughly 10%. Uh, but you know, by the same token, we're still seeing about 35 million moves that take place every year uh, in the United States alone. And those can be local moves, they can be long distance moves, and uh, anywhere in between. So, you know, you start thinking about it, that's a, that's a pretty big number. Uh, in addition to that, of that 35 million uh, moves that occur, you know, one of the interesting things is that a good portion of that are actually local moves. So there's a there's a real opportunity that you know again I believe you know the mobile storage niche has really been able to take advantage of. Uh, the the interesting component is with longer distance moves, uh, whereas uh, with traditional uh, you know mobile storage in a local environment, you know you may be getting a seventy nine dollar eighty nine ninety nine dollar delivery fee to deliver your boxes. Uh, with a long distance move, the uh, the overall cost of that move actually goes up pretty dramatically. And so there are some uh, good revenue opportunities for operators out there. Um, so you know what's interesting is that you know about three million moves a year uh, that take place are over fifty miles. And that's really what we look at when we consider what a long distance move uh, really is. And you know, if you look at that and try to determine, okay, well, how much money does that really represent in the overall U.S. economy? You know, that subset of the move population represents about a five billion dollar revenue opportunity overall. So, you know, even if uh, an operator can take part in a small percentage of the long distance move opportunity, uh, it's it still could. Uh, result in very strong positive revenue uh, for the operator. The other thing that's really interesting when you when you look at moving, 
Uh, and th this is something that's really fascinated me uh, since uh, joining the industry uh, several years ago, is really just the, the number of people who either use a rental truck or do it themselves uh, to move long distances. And I guess before getting into the industry, you know, you always assume that anybody who moves long distances uses a full service mover. And it's really not the case. You know, almost 75% of people who do move long distances are actually moving by using that rental truck or they, they uh, do it themselves. You know, pick up truck and, you know, pack up their car and, uh, you know, go west, young man, as it were. And, you know, those people are the ones who are, you know, value-based consumers who are looking for a little more flexibility and at a very cost competitive price. And that's one of the things that mobile storage really has the capability to do compared to a full service mover. So, you know, to tap into this complementary revenue stream, you know, one of the things that we really want to look at is what customers really looking for you know, uh, as they start evaluating different providers in the marketplace. And, and really, where does mobile storage fit into that? So, you know, really interesting uh, study that came out, uh, and they actually do it every year by J.D. Power, uh, actually gets the views of consumers and their moving experience. And, you know, number one, uh, consumers view moving as a commodity. So, it's price-driven. And that's... Uh, you know, a really critical, important factor. And obviously that's not for everyone, but uh, for the vast majority of people who are moving, price is what they look at, number one. The number two thing that customers consider uh, extremely important in uh, the move process is the availability to execute the move. Can you get me uh, from point A to point B in five days? Uh, can you make sure that my goods are going to be at my new place by the 31st of August because I start work September 1st. You know, those types of considerations are uh, at the forefront of customers. And then right below that is really the quality of service. Are they, are they getting on time delivery? Are they making sure that uh, whatever provider that they choose, uh, they don't end up either opening a storage container or opening the back of that truck and seeing, uh, you know, their, their nice Tiffany lamp broken in a thousand pieces. And what's really great and, you know, why, you know, we're very excited about the long distance side of the business is that, you know, mobile storage is really uniquely qualified to be able to answer a lot of these questions in a way that, uh, that really meets customers' needs quite effectively. So <coughs> what you see in front of you is just a quick and dirty breakdown of, uh, on the left-hand side, different ways that uh, a consumer can move. Um, what we've done is taken a um, base category, if you will, of the generic average long-distance move that takes place. Uh, American Moving and Storage Association has listed that, you know, the average long distance move, 1,200 miles with about 7,500 pounds of goods uh, on the vehicle. So using that as our, as our benchmark, if you will, just wanted to look at, you know, again, how mobile storage compared against van lines, which are uh, traditionally your full service movers. You know, you can think about people like United Van Lines and Allied Van Lines and Beacons and, and so on and so forth. Uh, rental trucks. You know, again, you can think about uh, folks like U-Haul, budget, and so forth. DIY, people who are do-it-yourselfers. And uh, the, the last category is really people who utilize uh, what's called a partial trailer option. And in that option, a customer, uh, you know, calls the company and a, you know, trailer of a, you know, tractor trailer uh, is parked in front of their house and they get to load up their uh, goods and uh, then put a partition called a bulkhead up uh, inside the trailer, and then that trailer is moved to the next person's, you know, home where they pack up the rest. And then that uh, vehicle is actually taken, you know, across town or across country. So 
these are sort of the most typical uh, different move categories that there are. Um, if you look at mobile storage, it is not the least expensive option out there versus, say, a rental truck and doing it yourself, uh, but it is uh, extremely cost competitive compared to van lines. And again, these, these prices are really just estimates that um, uh, you know, were taken about uh, two months ago, so you, know, you will see some price variation um, you know, every single day in the marketplace. Uh, but again, it's, it's cost competitive, and what does the customer get for it? Well, a lot of value from a delivery timing standpoint. You know, typically, a mobile storage is able to provide um, you know, fixed guaranteed times of when boxes uh, and units can be delivered. Um, and you know, sometimes they're given uh, a window of a day or two. And, um, you know, and that's really a, a strong convenience for somebody. Uh, from a packing standpoint, oftentimes, um, you know, with a lot of these options, the customer packs it themselves. Uh, one of the trends that we've seen is that, uh, you know, even though people want the uh, convenience of mobile storage, maybe because they want to pack over a longer period of time, um, or they uh, you just need to get, you know, more organized, that they're also taking advantage of local labor sources to actually pack up as well. So, you know, there are a couple of options there that mobile storage operators can participate in. The, in terms of claims rate, and I think this is really a, a, a pretty interesting piece to the story, you know, mobile storage has extremely low claims rates, both locally and long distances. And, and that runs very counter to, uh, you know, again, some of the surveys that we've seen through J.D. Power in terms of, uh, you know, van line movement uh, as well. So, you know, again, it's a, it's a very, because that customer typically is going to pack it themselves, Again, there's a real advantage there. Um, <clears throat> who transports the goods? And again, what's pretty interesting about this case is that there are lots of different options in terms of the way uh, goods are transported through uh, mobile storage. Um, and uh, whether you know the company does it themselves, whether they hire out uh, third-party LTL carriers and so forth, uh, there's just a lot of options that can be provided. And then I think the best component of this, and one of the things that uh, we've seen certainly in our business and then in talking to other uh, you know, members of the MSSA, is that you know, having that long-term storage option that is affordable is a big advantage for, for consumers. You know, I will tell you, you know, personally in, in Smartbox, we see a number of customers who have stored with us for 6, 8, 12 months, and then all of a sudden, just you know, have to have to move cross country or you know at least partially you know across state, and um, because we have a long distance option, it really helps them uh, to you know not have to unpack their belongings out of their box, get a full service mover, get a U-Haul or what have you. Just makes the entire process uh, seamless to them, and, uh, and that's a real advantage that customers are looking for. So how do you participate in, in a long distance uh, moving revenue opportunity? And you know, certainly this isn't all inclusive. You know, there are lots of ways that, a, that an operator can do it. Um, you know, one of the most common ways is for, uh, you know, if you're an individual uh, or uh, somebody who is not affiliated with either a franchise or a larger organization uh, of storage operators, you can join a, a long distance move network. You know, Pods has one through its uh, value-added reseller program. You know, certainly folks like Door to Door, uh, Smartbox, uh, all have networks that uh, you know you can uh, inquire about and participate in. And uh, you know, there's some real advantages to joining a network, which we'll discuss in a, in a little bit. Uh, another option is to do it yourself. So you know, are there options and opportunities to be able to move? Um, somebody within within your own state, or if you have the the proper uh, you know Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration um, uh, guidelines uh, approved, then you have uh, then you may be able to do some of this yourself. Um, and there's some caveats to that. Uh, and the third way is really to partner with a uh, with a van line uh, or a parcel trailer provider. Um, and again, the you know the one uh, difference 
in uh, that scenario, that typically customers are going to need to unload out of your storage containers to use a van line or a partial trailer option to go uh, long distances. So what are, you know, what what is really uh, what do we really need to consider when we start thinking about those various options? Um, you know, number one, and this is probably a question that you know, if you're contemplating uh, you know moving long distances, is probably the first the first question that comes up. How, you know, where do my storage units, my boxes, where do they go, um, and who delivers them to the new location? Uh, do you utilize a less than truckload carrier, and then if so, uh, locally, how does that box get uh, how does that box get delivered uh, on the back end? And then probably the the second question that comes out from that is how do I get my boxes back? Uh, certainly, if you are part of a a broader network, um, those networks oftentimes will um, provide boxes for their affiliate partners, which gives them the ability to uh, you know, basically use someone else's inventory uh, to uh, move people uh, long distances, and you really don't have to worry about that aspect. Certainly, if you do it yourself, um, that's a big consideration. You know, there are some groups that will move to a particular location and then um, you know, never get their box back. Um, so it's really up to you, uh, and you know, that kind of goes into how you would think about pricing. Um, the, the second component, which I think people often think about and, and really from a consideration standpoint that you need to be aware of is really transportation. So who manages that transportation link between the various locations? Um, so maybe you've talked to uh, another local provider, you know, you're in Chicago and you've talked to a local provider in Philadelphia and uh, you've, you've squared it away where you're going to be able to have somebody on one end um, you know, you'll be able to pick up boxes, and then uh, on, in Philadelphia, you have somebody who will deliver the, uh, the units to the customer once they've moved. But who handles that middle portion, and what does that look like? Um, again, there are, you know, LTL carriers that are uh, out there, um, but who manages it? And, and you know, there's a, there's a component there to make sure that, you know, the boxes are delivered in a timely basis and uh, that they happen, uh, you know, affordably. Um, and do you, do you use reputable carriers? Um, you know, do the people that you use to manage that transportation, do they utilize brokers? Brokers are folks who uh, basically pool cargo together. Uh, so just a couple of considerations to think about as you're, as you're uh, going through the, uh, the process. A couple other considerations, billing and payments. You know, how do customers get billed? Um, is it single billing where one bill is provided or are there multiple bills for each component, the origination end, the middle portion, uh, which is the main transportation, and then the, uh, the destination component? Um, if you're working as part of a network, how do you get paid? What are those terms? Um, you know, those are some things to really think about. And then what should you be paid for your services? You know, certainly if you were making a, a standard delivery out to a customer, um, you know, you'd get paid uh, your delivery fee if it's local. But from a long distance move standpoint, you know, you may not be participating as much in the uh, in the uh, longer term storage component of it. So, you know, really, how do you how do you get paid for that service? And so, you know, just a couple of questions that you need to ask as you go through the process. Um, the other a couple of other things uh, quickly: the insurance piece. What insurance? coverage do I need? You know, certainly as a, as a mobile storage operator, you know, we all have um, gotten quite familiar with the various uh, insurance policies that uh, we need. Uh, but in addition to that, because you're now moving customers' goods, uh, potentially, you know, across state, across the country, are there additional coverages that you need? And, uh, you know, that's going to vary a little bit, um, you know, based on what you're really trying to do and how you set up your program. And then probably most important, and the area where there's uh, the, most, the most gray area, is really regulatory. You know, if you want to do this on your own, what's it going to take? Um, you know, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration has certain rules and guidelines that uh, you need to abide by depending on what you're specifically doing. And, uh, you know, as a corollary to that, what are the kind of certifications that you need? 
Uh, are there specific things that, uh, that you need to be looking at on a federal level? Yes, there certainly are. In addition to that, each state, uh, you know, several of the states, I should say, govern uh, commerce and transportation a little bit differently than others. And so uh, those are some things that you need to keep in mind as well. So again, state regulations, you know, every situation is going to be different. And you know, if you're thinking about getting into long distance moving, you really need to consult legal assistance. So it's kind of my, uh, my caveat for the, for the session. But uh, you know, really, that's something you should do. This, this uh, remainder really provides just some basics on uh, you know, some different things that you need to be thinking about in terms of uh, how you classify yourself depending on what you need to do. Again, you know, classifications uh, are, are very important to the FMCSA, which is the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. Uh, and again, you know, whether you're typically going to be a private carrier, which means you transport your own cargo, which is something that typically uh, you would not be, but you know, there is the potential that you would have that opportunity. Uh, or whether you're for hire carrier, if you're the one who is actually doing the moving from point A to point B, um, you'll have to make that determination. Uh, and then, in addition to that, you know, more strictly, are you a common carrier or a contract carrier? Uh, again, all of these rules apply to uh, to you potentially, uh, depending on what you're trying to do and how you set up and organize your program. Uh, in addition to that, maybe you're not actually doing the long distance moving portion. Maybe you've outsourced that to a uh, LTL carrier or what have you. There's still some other considerations. Are you licensed as a freight forwarder? Um, you know, basically what a freight forwarder is is somebody who uh, arranges truck transportation of goods for somebody else, um, utilizing you know for hire carriers. Um, or are you also seen as a broker, somebody who actually um, brokers deals together uh, to uh, you know, build up a, a, from an LTL carrier to position goods uh, in, in an LTL carrier and then shipping them uh, long distances. So the, you know, a lot of these questions uh, that, that you'll need to get answered are you know, in a network setup where um, you know, you join a network or you become an affiliate um, are typically already done and classified for you. So that's one of the advantages of joining a, a, a network. Uh, alternatively, um, you know, again, there are some things that uh, legally, you know, if you plan on trying to do this yourself, that you'll want to uh, engage uh, legal uh, with that as well. And then, you know, the final thing is really uh, operating authority. And uh, I just bring this up because, you know, you need to make sure that, uh, you know, you are uh, certified to be able to go across state borders uh, if that's what you plan on doing. And typically operating authority just dictates uh, where your company may go and the cargo it may carry uh, within a specific uh, geographical area. So again, you know, we really see long distance for the market itself as a uh, very strong, fertile, uh, additional revenue source uh, for all mobile storage providers. Uh, and although it can be complicated, you know, there are multiple ways that you can do it to avoid a lot of that complication, whether it's joining a network, partnering with a van line, or what have you. So uh, with that, I will uh, turn it back over to uh, Poppy and Rebecca, and uh, if we have any questions, uh, I guess now's the time to open that up. Okay, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, I think we are just about out of time um, since the presentation did run a little long, so we will answer any questions that have been submitted by way of email uh, after the webinar has concluded. Uh, we do want to pass on some additional information to you. Um, we'd like, if you'd like to learn more about uh, mobile self-storage and the future of the mobile self-storage industry, we invite you to join the association 
for its 2009 annual conference held in conjunction with the National Portable Storage Association's conference. The event will be held October 25th through 27th at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas. Association members will receive information this week by email. And if you are not yet a member of the association, you can look for more information later this month on the association website. Uh, this will include how to become an exhibitor or a sponsor of this uh, trade show. You may also call the asso association headquarters for more information about either the trade show or joining the association at area code 703-416-0060. Again, that number is area code 703-416-0060. And we hope that we provided you with useful information to assist you in your self-storage and mobile self-storage endeavors. You will receive an email by Monday with a link to the archived presentation along with a special offer, so make sure you watch your inbox for that email. And last but certainly not least, for more information about our upcoming webinars, please visit our website. Our next webinar will be held on August 25th. The topic is Three Pillars of Profitable Facility Marketing to Keep You Strong Through the Winter in 2010. And our presenter will be one of today's speakers, Derek Naylor. Thank you to everyone for attending, and have a wonderful rest of the day.